Okay, so my name is Paulus, and I would like to talk about two projects. Um, one is called Unravel, and the other one is called Unravel. Um, and I'm pretty excited about those projects, and I'm going to tell you why I'm excited. But before I do that, um, I want to talk about something else. So I want to talk about experience. Um, and specifically, I want to talk about the experience of programming in Clojure. So <coughs> imagine that somebody comes up to you and asks you, um, what is it like to program in Clojure? Right? So this might be the beginning of an answer. So some languages like Java sort of encourage a top-down approach to programming. So whenever you make a change to the source, it requires recompiling the program and restarting the process. And a lot of the decisions are driven by static analysis tools, like the ones that are provided by your IDE. Now, for better or worse, um, the approach that Clojure takes, or a lot of Clojure programmer takes, uh, programmers take, to pro problem solving is different. So here's what Clojure programmers usually do. They take a task, they break it into different parts, then they write functions for each of those parts. And then they'll um, sort of try to exercise those functions with sample input. They'll test um, if the results uh, match the expectations, and if they don't, they'll repeat the process. So Clojure sort of encourages a more bottom-up bottom uh, approach to programming. And I think this applies to debugging as well. So when I debug, I usually identify a general problem area. Then I come up with a, a list of usual suspects, like uh, functions that might be behaving incorrectly. And then I exercise each of the functions with sample data. And I compare the result to the expectations. And you know, at some point, I'll probably realize uh, which one of the functions is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So once you find the incorrect functions, uh, you can change the implementation. And you can do that in the running system. Uh, you can do it just by re-evaluating the definitions. So I don't want to argue at all that either of those approaches is superior. I do have my preferences, but that's not the point. The, the point now is that closure programming sort of feels different. It feels more incremental. It feels more exploratory, and it feels more data-centric. So this is a kind of a unique approach to problem solving. Maybe it's not unique to Clojure. And it's probably not the only way to program Clojure. But I think it's a sort of a good recipe. So the outline of the recipe is this. You build up state, you run the code, and you rerun until you get things right. That's kind of how it works. And what enables this is that we are able to change the logic at runtime, and we can inspect the data structures that uh, we're working with at runtime. And of course, we can only follow this dynamic recipe for programming if we have a long-running web per process we can be working with. Stuart Holloway has a talk out uh, with the title Repl Driven Development uh, from just a couple of weeks ago, and it's, it's great. You should definitely watch it. And in the talk, he gives a lot of practical advice on how to uh, improve your workflow when you're working with REPLs. And he also goes into the whys, into the reasons why a REPL is crucial to closure programmers. So he covers that ground pretty well, so I'm not going to go any deeper into those topics. What I want to talk about is tools. So the, the workflow that Stuart uh, describes is one that requires setting up a short feedback loop. And the point I want to make is that we need tools that support this workflow as best 
as possible. So, for example, you may be playing around with logic. You re-invoke functions with a sample input. And at the same time, you need to be able to see what's going on. You need to be able to inspect intermediate values, and you need to be able to uh, inspect the results. So this is what our tools should look like, I think. They should support an explore, exploratory approach. And we sh they should uh, uh, sort of um, su support and encourage this data-centric approach to, to programming. So again, there are uh, different ways you could be working. You know, uh, Different programmers have different styles. But if you pick uh, a style of working, then you should have the tools that are appropriate to that style of working. And if your development is rapid driven, then you need tools that are appropriate to this style. You need uh, tools that make working with REPLs pleasant. So I think we should try to come up with the best possible REPL tools that we can build. So this raises the question, you know, what would the future look like uh, with better REPL tools? And I think this is a difficult question to answer. Um, the two projects that I uh, started the talk with, Unrepl and Unravel, uh, grew out of an attempt to answer this question. Um, to give you some background, there was some discussion about improving uh, the state of the REPL uh, back in 2015 on the closure dev mailing list. Um, and earlier this year, Christophe Grand and I got to talking about uh, these topics, and we started designing Unrepl and Unravel. So Unrepl is the protocol. It's sort of in the same space as Nrepl, I know, confusing names. Um, and Christophe Grand um, did all the heavy lifting for the implementation, uh, although I was lucky enough to be able to contribute a couple of design ideas to the, to the protocol. And then finally, Unravel, I don't know if you can see the bottom line, is the command line client um, that is sort of the first implementation of this protocol. Okay, so the conf confusing names uh, are confusing, so I drew a little diagram. <laughs> so Unravel is the client, talks to the closure process, through the protocol, which is called Unrepl. OK, um, so the rest of this talk is going to be part, part uh, practical and part conceptual. And because everybody likes demos, I'm going to start with the practical part. So. Unrepl is, as I said, a command line client, uh, so you can install it uh, on your machine. And it's pretty easy to install if you have NPM installed. I know that NPM has some uh, problems sometimes, but for the most part it works pretty well. So this is how you use it. You can also use Yarn, which uh, these days I prefer if I can. And the next thing you need to do is to set up your a uh, closure process to uh, accept uh, connections uh, in the form of the socket server. Uh, that's a feature that was introduced in Closure 1.8, and it's actually pretty simple to uh, enable. The only thing you need to do is to set a Java system property called closure.server.something to an Eden string, which is pretty much self-explanatory, I think. And once you do that, you can sort of netcat or telnet into the process. And what you see is simply a uh, command prompt that you're used to when you start the regular closure jar um, with uh, the main module. Um, the next version of boot will have a task uh, that makes this even easier. So you can just type boot socket server and it'll automatically start a socket server in the background. OK, um, as you saw just a minute ago, you can use Telnet to connect to a socket server, a socket server REPL. 
And Unravel is designed to be sort of a drop-in replacement for that. So instead of going netcat localhost 5055, you can go Unravel localhost 5055. And what you see is pretty similar, um, except that you have this little banner at the beginning. But uh, Unravel comes with a couple of features that the basic um, bare closure main REPL does not have. So one of the things that people have come to expect is read line um, like editing functionality. So this means that you can sort of um, move around in the line that you're currently editing with the cursor keys and you can use like control W to uh, delete the last word and things like this. Um, Unravel also comes with basic support for tab completion. It's not perfect yet, but it can sort of um, complete vars and namespaces. One more uh, feature that you're probably not missing if you don't have it, uh, but it's really important and, and you'll probably notice if you don't have it, is the ability to, uh, if, uh, to interrupt evaluations. So for example, if you accidentally type uh, thread sleep long max value, uh, at some point you probably get uh, tired of waiting and you want to stop the process. And you can just do that by using control C when you're using Unravel. Okay, now <laughs> moving on to the more interesting features. Um, the first one I want to mention is that Unravel is aimed to have a very fast startup time. So this is sort of in comparison to the normal way we start REPL is using line REPL or boot REPL. And in my experience, that always takes some time to get going. Unravel, on the other hand, um, has a sub-second uh, startup time, and there's still some room for improvements there. And how is that possible? Um, we know that closure sometimes can be slow to start up. Uh, the, the trick is to use Lumo. Uh, Lumo is a closure script environment uh, based on Node.js, and based on the closure script bootstrap compiler. And it's developed by Antonio Montero, who introduced it mm, a, little bit more, a little bit more than half a year ago here in Berlin uh, at the Closure Meetup. Uh, and since he did that, it has come uh, a long way. Uh, I really encourage you to check it out. It's amazing for you know, testing a little theory about Closure Script, uh, trying things out. Um, but you can also use it to build real command line applications because it gives you all the um, libraries available in the NPM ecosystem, and you can, you can just use them uh, using um, JavaScript interop. So if there's one thing uh, I want you to take home, not really related to the uh, main topic of the talk, uh, then it's check out Lumo. It's really amazing. OK, um, then we also have a couple of smaller um, Nice to have features. One of these is the ability to show incomplete forms. So, for example, as you can see here, it's really big. Uh, so, maybe it's more obvious when it's so big. Um, but uh, what I did here is to mistype one of the parentheses as a, as a square bracket. And uh, Unravel will let you know immediately by showing a red namespace indicator. So. It, uh, you know, you don't have to actually send the form to the um, REPL to, to get feedback. OK, so the next feature, uh, I recorded a little demo here. You can see when you type a namespace or you type uh, a name of a function, um, it immediately shows you a short doc string. OK, it's a little bit fast. You can sort of get the, get the point. Um, it shows you um, a doc string of the function, describing the function, basically the first a couple of lines of the doc string, um, along with the function signature. So you immediately know um, which arguments to pass to the function. Um, if you want to, you can press Control O, and that gives you the complete doc string of the function. This is a feature that is available in uh, CIDR, and it's very useful there. But I find it useful as well when you're working 
um, in a terminal repo. Okay, so this is uh, the interactive bit of the, the talk. So I would like to ask you, who has seen something like this? You type something into your REPL, and then you get just a huge dump. Anyone? Like, uh, just a quick show of hands? Okay, <laughs> almost everyone. <laughs> yeah, so for, for me, it's really common, and uh, I get annoyed every time. So we try to do something about it. So what Unravel does, and what the Unravel protocol does behind the scenes, is to restrict the um, printing of lazy sequences, or of sequences in general. So when Unravel prints a sequence, it will only print uh, a certain number of elements uh, up to the variable print length. I'll show you how it works in a second. Um, but what the client will do is to show an elision mark, uh, three dots, to show that not all elements have been displayed yet. And the user can sort of request the continu continuation explicitly a la carte. So this is how it looks. Again, a demo. So here I uh, am uh, bold enough to just type the range function into the REPL, which is a you know a no-no in a regular closure REPL because it would almost um, crash the whole thing. But here it's, it's sort of fine, right? You you just get the first ten elements and then you can say uh, explicitly if you want to see more. I mentioned Stuart Holloway's talk uh, at the beginning, and I still think it's a really amazing talk. You should watch it, definitely. Um, but there's one thing I want to sort of take issue a bit, uh, a little bit. Uh, and he, he, what he says is, you shouldn't be typing things into a REPL. And the conf confession I should make is, I really like typing things into a REPL. I like terminal REPLs. I like line-based REPLs. Um, so, of course, what Stuart means is that um, you should use an editor, like a proper editor, like editor, uh, like like Emacs or Cursive, maybe, uh, and uh, use all the facilities that the editor gives you um, to edit your code, and then sort of send it off to the REPL, um, like that. Well, you can here basically see how I how I work with. Uh, sequences, just sort of exploring uh, how to solve a problem. In this case, getting uh, the users in my etc password uh, file uh, and sort of doing that with Unravel and uh, displaying some of the features. Um, so I agree that it's useful to use um, a buffer backed by a REPL in the style popularized by Emacs. Um, and I do it all the time, of course. But I still think it should also be possible to just have this line-based interface. And I think it's a really good interface, you know? It's, it, it sort of um, gives you a lot of headspace because you can only, only focus on your problem. You're, you're only looking at this one line that you're typing right now. Um, and you also get read line history, so you get almost an infinite history of all the stuff that you typed into a REPL before. And that can be very valuable because it... Um, uh, it uh, you know it it can have all kinds of gems uh, and tricks um, in it, and if if you want to go back, you just have to search your history. So, I really like typing things into a REPL. Up to a certain point, at some point, you know, you want to make things a little bit more permanent, and just copy them over to the editor. Okay, so that's it for the part uh, where I'm talking about the command line client, about, um, about Unravel. Um, now I want to talk a little bit more about the motivation uh, uh, behind uh, building um, Unravel. So how do we um, expose a REPL? Well, maybe the first question to ask would be, what is a REPL anyway? So um, I, it always occurred to me that maybe a better word for REPL would be PREPL, because the phases that you go through are actually more accurate, uh, accurately described that way. So there's a prompt phase. You see the prompt. 
then um, the wrapper reads uh, a string, evaluates that string, prints the result back, and then sort of loops to the beginning. And maybe there could be another um, letter in that uh, abbreviation for compilation as well. If you want to look at a blueprint of how uh, a REPL works, it's a good idea to look at the function signature of the closure main REPL function, which is sort of the, the basic REPL interface that closure comes with. And there's uh, another version introduced recently called closure core server REPL, which is almost the same thing. So how do we expose a REPL? How do we communicate with a REPL? So maybe the most straightforward answer to that question would be to sort of do it the Unix way. So you start a process, the terminal is connected to the process, and the process reads from STD in and writes to standard output. So that works for uh, like a line-based REPL, and it also works sort of for buffer-based REPLs. So for example, Emacs um, comes with uh, this idea of in inferior processes, uh, which is uh, Emacs jargon for uh, the ability to launch a process in the background that is sort of connected to the buffer that you're working in. And uh, if you type something into the buffer, that gets sent to the, to the process and vice versa. Uh, I should mention the inf closure um, uh, Emacs mode that Andrea Ricciardi has been working on a lot uh, lately. Um, and it works based on this principle. And I think it's good, it's, you know, it's simple, it's, it's straightforward, but it has some significant drawbacks. So one of those drawbacks is that it only allows a single REPL per process for kind of obvious reasons, because a Unix process can only have one standard input and one standard output. So the, the, the solution to this is to decouple the inferior process from the editor process. And I think you want to do that because it's a bit annoying if the REPL is um, sort of uh, dependent on the editor in this way. So for example, if you restart the editor, suddenly your program also um, has to restart. And that uh, messes with your REPL uptime. So yeah, the, the, the obvious solution to this is to use a TCP connection to mediate between the editor and the server or the process. And you may ask, uh, you know, isn't that exactly what nREPL is doing? So again, you know, it's slightly di uh, confusing name, nREPL and unREPL. And it's true that nREPL is a, is a fantastic project. It's mature, it works really well. It's been used in a lot of projects, so uh, we wouldn't be where we are today in the closure community without nREPL, that's for sure. So for example, if you're using CIDR these days, um, CIDR is based on the nREPL protocol. Um, nREPL itself is an RPC protocol uh, and uses asynchronous communication, sort of sending messages back and forth uh, with a REPL process. And as I said, it, I think that's fine, it's a good approach, uh, but Unrepl has decided to take a different approach here. So one of the reasons, I'm just going to explain, I'm going to explain the design goals in a, in a minute, but before I do that, just, just a few preliminary remarks about that. Um, so one of the reasons we went this way is that we want Unrepl to have a low barrier of entry for new developments. So we want people to be you know, um, quick to just uh, jump in and write a new tool based on the Unrepl protocol. And that's proven a little bit more difficult with um, Nrepl because of the choice of the technologies used there. Second point I want to make is that Unrepl uses the 
um, sort of standard REPL um, way of uh, communicating use a synchronous stream-based um, interface. Whereas NREPL, as I mentioned, uh, is based on asynchronous communication. And I think that makes UnRepl a little bit more closer to the spirit of Lisp REPLs. And then finally, this is maybe a superficial difference, but uh, UnRepl was started you know, in the spring of this year. So it can use a lot of the features that were introduced in Clojure uh, since NREPL was started. Um, and maybe the most important of those features is the introduction of the socket server functionality. Really uh, uh, a feature without which we wouldn't be able to implement UnRepl as easily. Okay, so for the rest uh, of the talk, I just want to um, explain the design goals that were in play uh, when we came up with the UnRepl protocol. So the first one sort of ties in with what I've, I've just mentioned. Um, UnRepl is based on streams. So it's based on the idea that um, using a stream as the input and output mechanism is is a good idea. So again, if you look at this uh, Clojure main REPL blueprint, you can see the different ways in which you can customize a REPL. So you could change the way the prompt is printed. You can change the way um, characters are read into forms, into Clojure data structures. You can uh, customize the evaluation function. And you can customize the way um, values are printed back to the REPL, to the, to the REPL user. And something that you don't see maybe at first, glance is, at first glance is that all of these functions, these anonymous functions uh, passed to the uh, REPL function, each take uh, an implicit argument as well uh, in the form of dynamic vars. Uh, so uh, the most important, important of, of those are the earmuff in and earmuff out um, vars, which represent the input stream and the output stream, respectively. So this is really close in uh, spirit to the you know, Unix idea of communica communicating using standard input and standard output. And you can sort of s understand a REPL process as a conversation, something that reads from standard input from earmuff in and writes responses to earmuff out. So that's basically the, the distilled version of what a REPL does. So I mentioned that um, UnRepl uses streams. It uses input streams and output streams. But the output stream is actually not, as in a classical REPL, a stream of characters. Instead, it's a stream of objects. It's a stream of um, values. Um, so the the protocol we uh, or the encoding we chose for UnRepl is Eden, uh, which has the really neat feature that if you netcat into a running um, UnRepl server, um, you can sort of see what's going on by just looking at the uh, Eden. Uh, values that are returned by the server. Because we as human beings are used to, <laughs> or as closure programmers, are used to parse uh, closure syntax, so it's really easy for us to understand Eden syntax as well. So the problem with the you know, original character-based stream is that a, a single uh, output stream includes many different things. It includes you know, stuff that gets uh, legitimately printed by the functions, if it is, for example, using print uh, inside the function. But it also includes the evaluation result of the function. And it includes the prompt, the, the namespace indicator, and maybe also stuff relating to exceptions. So if, as a tooling author, you were to sort of go in and look at that, you, you would have to pass that. And you would have a really hard time at, at doing that. So instead, what UnRepl is returning is a stream of Eden values. 
Uh, instead of having all of these elements intermingled in a single character stream, in Unrepl, they are neatly separated as separate messages. So there's an out message, there's a um, prompt message, there's an uh, evaluation result message, and so forth. So Eden gives you sort of these both, both of these things. It's convenient for the machines to pass, and it's still kind of friendly to tooling authors because the authors are human beings and they can look at the Eden uh, that is uh, printed out and, and sort of get a sense of what's going on. So this, uh, this is about the input, uh, the output stream, but now I want to talk about the input stream. And uh, Unrepl started with the design goal of actually not doing anything with the input stream. So instead of, instead of sort of um, legislating a format for what goes into Unrepl, you can just send any closure forms you like, just as you would with the closure main REPL. So prescribing an input uh, format is an anti-goal of anti REPL, for of, uh, of UnREPL. So whether you're sending regular evalua evaluations, like for example, equals one, two to the REPL, or you're sending tooling commands, all of those things take the form of regular closure function calls. I mentioned that Unrepl requires um, closure 1.8, and one of the reasons for that is that the socket server feature was introduced in that version. The neat thing about this is that it enables Unrepl to be um, very frugal when it comes to dependencies. So you don't need anything uh, running in the server except for what comes in the regular closure jar. No further dependencies are required. <coughs> And this also means that the obstacle to configure your server are very, very low. The only thing you need to do is configure the um, system property that I mentioned before. There's no additional setup required on the server side. Fifth design principle is upgradability. Um, so the idea is that we can start with a REPL that does one thing and can sort of transform it into a REPL that does another thing. And in the case of UnREPL, we use this principle by taking a closure main REPL and transforming it into an um, UnREPL session. Um, the way this works, and it's uh, kind of an interesting concept, is that the entire Unrepl source code, it's kind of 100 lines or so of closure source code, gets concatenated into a single blob. And when an Unrepl client, for example, Unrevel, connects to a socket server, it sends all of that code over to the server and uh, waits until it receives the first Unrepl message. And that would be the uh, unrepl hello message. And once you get that message, the first Eden value, um, you can assume that the rest of the session is going to be, you know, um, structured in the way that you expect with the unrepl protocol. A serious a stream of Eden values. And the final principle I wanted to mention, because it's a cool name, uh, Transclusion, and I also had to look this up if anyone is uh, uh, wondering what that means. So, transclusion means that a server, in responding to a res request, um, responds with a full description of the resource that it is returning. This is something that is well known from, you know, by the book implementations of. Uh, REST web services, where, for example, if you post to a root, you get back a HTTP uh, response that it includes as one of the response headers a 
pointer to the resource that was just created. And it's sort of a full exp explanation, a full URL uh, that points to that resource. And in the same way, unravel, for example, when uh, an elision uh, gets generated, will return a marker that um, allows you to uh, request a continu continuation of that lazy sequence. And that marker itself is just a closure form that you can just send back to the server. So you don't really need to know a lot about the protocol to use it. Again, you can almost use it from LATCAD if you wanted to. So that uh, sort of wraps up what I uh, wanted to uh, tell you. Um, the basic idea of Unrepl is pretty simple. I encourage you to go and look at the protocol specification. It's pretty simple. Um, I also encourage you to try out Unravel as a sort of a proof of concept that it actually works. Um, you can use it with your, um, you know, with your boot or Linegan or just regular um, jar, uh, closure jar um, processes. And the idea behind Unravel really is that um, it should make um, it easier for tooling authors to come up with new tools to make um, improvements. Um, about the experience of writing closure code. And here I just mentioned a couple of ideas um, how that might look like. Uh, I just saw uh, on another person's screen like it just a, you know, a, a not pretty printed Eden value with a lot of random keys. You know, it's really hard to see the forest for the trees in that uh, um, you know, in that, in that way of presenting information. And if we had, you know, a better interactive inter inspector uh, widget for, for those kinds of values, that would be really valuable. And that's the kind of thing you could um, develop using uh, Unravel. So that's about it. Thanks for listening. Uh, please check out the project and please uh, give Unravel or Unravel a try. Thank you very much.